this session uh, so that uh, we can make it available for people that uh, couldn't uh, connect and um, it's then something that they can access. So um, hello everyone, I'm a Professor uh, Boisvert, I'm the group leader here in the Centre for Particle Physics, which is at the uh, Royal Holloway University of London. And uh, today, um, the order of the day will be that we will first give you a presentation introducing our research group, um, the various activities uh, that we do um, in our group and the sort of PhD opportunities that are available. Um, and after that, we will get a quick tour of our facilities since this is online. So we thought we would uh, give you a, a taste of uh, what it's like to, to work in our laboratories and using our facilities. And then that should take us about uh, an hour to cover all of this so at about uh, 3 p.m. Then um, we will open some breakout rooms uh, where you're, you're going to have a, a chance to navigate one or several breakout rooms to go discuss more specifically with the uh, various uh, supervisors and also with the uh, current PhD students in case you have questions uh, specifically aimed at uh, current PhDs. Right, so hopefully uh, you will enjoy uh, the event and will be available for question um, at the end as well. So let me uh, share my uh, screen so we can start with the presentation. Here we are. So um, Okay, so welcome. Uh, so this is the Center for Particle Physics uh, open event. And essentially, um, particle physics uh, is centered on our successful theory, the standard model. And so you can see here the main ingredients. And so effectively, we can think of our research as uh, sort of uh, focusing on these various constituents of matter, quarks, leptons, uh, forces, the Higgs boson, which sort of uh, is the field giving mass to all the particle and is an extra field and, and particle that we've discovered quite uh, recently. Um, and um, interestingly for us, there are still many, many fundamental questions about particle physics and about the universe in general. Um, for example, we have evidence of um, dark matter and dark energy. So what is that exactly about? Um, could there be more dimensions than the dimension of space and time that we're familiar with? Um, what is uh, the whole business of antimatter? Um, and also about uh, black holes and, and things like that. And um, interestingly, our research group tends to cover all of these uh, fundamental questions, and you'll hear a lot more about this. And we have a very strong connection in our group between um, sort of particle physics done at sort of energy, high energy colliders at the energy frontier, and also with astrophysics. And so uh, the fact that the energy density of the universe is composed of dark matter at 25%, uh, that is also a, a nice connection between particle physics and astrophysics as well. So just a quick rundown of our center. We have about 12 academic staff, some uh, engineers and technical support staff, some postdoctoral researchers, a big group of postgraduate students. And also we typically have a few um, MSc students also involved in our activities. And you can see here the main uh, research groupings within our center. So we have a big group on the um, ATLAS detector, which makes use of the LHC accelerator. Uh, so we have our involvement um, dates back from about 1990. Our um, detector uh, responsibilities and involvement centers on electronics related with the data acquisition system and also with the triggering of the experiment and we're very involved in the upgrade activities um, as well. Then we have a big group on uh, particle astrophysics involved in direct dark matter searches and also neutrino uh, physics and new particle detector development uh, in related with uh, both uh, dark matter and neutrino experiments. We have two theorists that do uh, LHC phenomenology 
and also early universe cosmology. And you'll hear a lot more about all of these things uh, soon. And we have a group working on Exciter Science, part of the John Adams Institute. So this is uh, sort of the, the accelerator component, whether it's beam diagnostics or design studies for uh, future accelerators. And we also have uh, a member of academic staff working on gravitational wave astronomy. So for example, uh, on the uh, LIGO experiment, which you may have heard about. So um, just a little bit of information about um, PhD. So first of all, uh, funding is available. So uh, this is, we have STFC funded position available for all areas of our center. STFC is the name of our uh, UK uh, research uh, grant um, organization. Um, and then we also have joint funding positions with various labs and organizations. So for example, with CERN, and we also have college funded uh, studentships that are available. So if you have more questions about that, then we can uh, in the breakout room sort of answer any question you might have about this. We have a Rutherford prize. So this is a thousand pound prize that we give to an exceptionally promising PhD applicant uh, that would be started in October, 2022. And we have many opportunities available in the center. Uh, so for example, you get to attend a national and an international summer schools during your PhDs. Uh, if you're an experimentalist that um, does some of the work in a research lab, then um, you might then get a, a long-term attachment. So that means spending um, about a year or so in that lab. So for example, working on Atlas, this would be going to CERN. Uh, and working on a neutron experiment, this would be uh, working, um, spending some time in, in the lab that uh, is doing those neutrino experiments, just to give you an example. We have also the possibility of internships. So we have students that in the past have done various um, internships. So this could be a science policy uh, internship, or this could be uh, internships in, in sort of industry. So uh, we have uh, students that have done those. And so we have contacts in various industry and organization so that we could help you uh, apply for uh, some of those. Okay, so now what we will do is uh, we will go through the various uh, research groupings and give you a little feel about uh, the academics working on these groups and, and what they do and the kind of PhD projects that are available. So I will start with the um, ATLAS experiment because my own research is on ATLAS. So I'll be able to tell you a bit more about uh, this uh, research group. So this is the biggest detector in the world and the NH is the most powerful accelerator ever built. So we, uh, we like working on, on big things uh, in our center. Um, and as I mentioned, the uh, Royal Holloway group is involved in the trigger software and um, our physics analyses is very diverse. So uh, the kind of figure that you have here are just schematics of what we mean by the trigger. We mean that there are so many collisions happening that you need to select the ones that are interesting. So that's the job of the trigger. And so we design uh, various electronic cards, which you can see um, here. So um, going on to the various members of our group. So Professor Pedro uh, Teixeira Diaz has a very long uh, standing uh, interest and experience in the Higgs boson. So both uh, searching for it. And now that we found it, uh, we need to measure its properties. And it's very central to the whole of the standard model. So it's a key piece um, for the origin of mass uh, for elementary particle. Uh, recent um, activities have focused on when the Higgs is produced in conjunction with a top quark, uh, which is a very challenging channel, but a, a very uh, important one as well. And more generally about studying its, its properties, like its mass, its coupling, and the various ways that it is uh, produced. Uh, my own research interests focus on the top quark. Uh, so this is uh, not only the heaviest quark, but it's actually the heaviest particle ever uh, detected. And so that has all sort of interesting consequence uh, for the top quark and it's connected to various um, sort of theory that go beyond the standard model. So uh, that is uh, an interesting and very rich area to look for what would, will come 
uh, at what we call new physics, so beyond the sand model, all these important questions that I mentioned um, earlier. And a recent activity of mine has been uh, to have the most precise uh, top, quas top quark mass measurement uh, within uh, Atlas using quite a novel uh, technique. Um, Dr. Berry uh, is interested in exotic phenomena, so um, I mentioned if there are um, extra dimensions to space and time that we're familiar with, this could be connected with why gravity is so weak, and so searching for um, signs of those extra dimension in various ways, uh, but using uh, quite uh, simple final states to sort of then uh, have access to those new particles and um, these extra dimensions. So uh, that's a, a recent interest as well of uh, Dr. Berry. Professor Glenn Cowan, uh, some of you might have him as your lecturer uh, in the uh, master statistical methods that um, Professor Cowan is, is currently um, teaching. He's also the author of statistical data analysis and an author of the PDG for the statistics chapters. So as you can gather, his research interests are in developing uh, statistical methods for data analysis. So this could be about uh, multivariate machine learning uh, methods, but also other ones. And he applies that to Atlas data analysis. So for example, combination of various Higgs uh, channel, but also uh, for example, uh, top physics as well. There's uh, discussing the top mass. Actually, we have lots of analyses that measure the top mass. And so the best possible measurement will be a combina combination of all of those, but uh, that has interesting uh, statistical uh, questions related with that. And so now I'm going to pass on to my colleague who will tell you more about our particle astrophysics activities in the group. Hi, so I'm Asher Kavath. I'm one of the uh, faculty members in particle astrophysics. Um, we work on a large number of experiments um, all over the world, and we're really interested in understanding how to detect rare, um, uh, rare interactions um, with big impacts on the, the structure and history of our universe. Can I have the next slide? So um, one of the major components of our research is um, dark matter. We know that, that dark matter exists in the universe. It sits in some halo around um, the Milky Way. So we know it's there through various kinds of astrophysical measurements from you know, studying how galaxies rotate to looking at how clusters of galaxies collide um, to looking at evidence for dark matter in the early universe. But we're, we don't really know what it is. And as we're particle physicists, we're interested in understanding um, exactly what dark matter might be. Um, and so that involves building very big experiments, um, putting them underground in various places around the world, um, and sitting for a long time and waiting for, uh, you know, extremely rare interactions to maybe come and, and happen in our detectors. All right, next slide. The other thing that we work on in our group is um, studying neutrinos, and in particular, the oscillatory behavior of neutrinos. We've got three uh, flavors of neutrinos, and that's how we figure out how neutrinos interact in a detector. There's also three masses of neutrinos, um, but those things don't line up in a one-to-one -one way. And by having neutrinos travel very far over space and time, um, uh, we can see one flavor of neutrino turn into another, and that's neutrino oscillation. Um, and this is something that we think or hope might hold some key to the matter-antimatter asymmetry in our universe. Um, so understanding, you know, why we see a universe that has lots of stuff in it rather than a universe that is equal parts matter um, and antimatter. And, uh, you know, members of the group have won the breakthrough prize for this kind of research and neutrino oscillations were recognized with the Nobel Prize in uh, 2015. None of us, but, you know, in, in general um, in the world. Um, and so it's a, an exciting aspect of research. Uh, next slide. So there are three academics in the neutrino um, dark matter group. So the first academic is uh, Professor Jocelyn Munro. Um, uh, Jocelyn works on uh, argon-based dark matter experiments. Uh, so one of those experiments is called uh, Dark Side, and that's going to be an experiment that's going to be located underneath a mountain in Italy. So you know, very nice if you come and you know be a student, you can go off to Italy and eat some delicious food uh, and do some science. Uh, and we're particularly interested in developing a new kind of photon detector for that. 
which has the potential to make really high resolution uh, measurements uh, and, and give us a, a strong ability to, to look for these very rare interactions of dark matter. Jocelyn also works on a project called Quest DMC. Um, and so Quest DMC is a, a very tiny experiment actually, um, where we're looking to use superfluid helium-3 in order to search for um, a dark matter that has a, a spin to it. Um, and so this is a, a, a new idea for a dark matter detector and it's in collaboration with the low temperature physics group um, uh, at Royal Holloway and other low temperature physics groups within the UK. Um, so our condensed matter colleagues who are in the other part of the Royal Holloway um, physics department are working with us to develop um, this technology to make sort of roughly a cubic centimeter of this superfluid helium-3 um, instrument it and search for dark matter. And the thing that this new technology lets us do is to search for dark matter that has really, really low mass. Um, you need a, a, a lighter element for it to interact with to detect those kinds of interactions and superfluid helium also has interesting properties um, related to spin. Um, and, and so that's a project that's taking place, you know, kind of across the UK. Oh, there's Jocelyn, she's just arrived. All right, next slide. Um, so I mentioned already, I'm Asher Cabeth. Um, so I work on a couple of different projects. So I'll first tell you about my neutrino projects um, where I'm really focused on searching for this uh, neutrino oscillation phenomenon I described, and in particular looking for this matter, matter, matter antimatter asymmetry. Um, so I work on the TDK neutrino oscillation experiment, um, which is in Japan. Uh, and so this is a running experiment. It's been running for about a decade now and has currently produced the world leading um, constraints on CP violation. I'm particularly interested in understanding, you know, how neutrinos interact and, you know, how we characterize um, uh, our neutrinos before they undergo an oscillation process um, so that we can get the most precise um, results. And the top image that I'm showing you here is, uh, is what we call the near detector of the TDK experiment. Um, and that's a detector we put in place so that we can understand how many neutrinos we've got, how much they're interacting before they have any chance to go off uh, and oscillate. Uh, and you can see I've labeled some neutrino interactions um, in that detector. Um, and so a project here would really be looking at the data that's coming in from this, this experiment uh, using new techniques. Um, and over the next couple of years, there'll be um, upgrades to this detector that I'm showing you here, um, where we have a lot of exciting opportunities um, uh, in order to do new, new analyses and, and make even better constraints on CP violation. I also work on a future experiment doing almost exactly the same thing, um, which is called DUNE. Um, that experiment will be located at Fermilab in the United States, um, where I'm working on developing, you know, kind of how sensitive is this experiment going to be to these oscillations? And also, what do we need to do to build our detectors um, uh, in order to make the most precise kind of, of measurements um, uh, you know, to do these kind of constraints that I've, I've been talking about. Um, so both of these experiments have opportunities um, to go and spend time at uh, J Park in the case of TDK or Fermilab in the case of Dune um, as part of an LTA and, and work with, you know, very leading scientists uh, there um, for these projects. On the dark matter side of my research, I work on an experiment called LZ. LZ is the liquid xenon um, dark matter experiment. Um, it's deep in a mine in South Dakota. It's a very beautiful part of the world. Um, lots of mountains and hiking and things like that. Um, and this is a xenon-based experiment. Um, and uh, you know the xenon experiments have really been pushing um, the world um, dark matter limits. Um, <clears throat> and so I'm particularly interested in, in producing those dark matter limits. Um, you know, I work with um, uh, my students both at Royal Holloway and throughout the experiment. Um, in order to produce, you know, those limits. Um, LZ is turning on um, right now and over the course of a PhD that would start in October 2022, um, there would be many opportunities to get involved with actually performing um, dark matter searches and uh, going ahead um, uh, to, you know, make the most sensitive uh, limit or with any luck, a detection. Um, uh, I also am particularly interested in, in how we calibrate this kind of detector um, uh, and, uh, you know, making sure we know exactly what's happening inside it. All right, Veronique, next slide. And finally, this year we have joining um, to the group, um, Luke Pickering, um, who comes uh, to join us and works on uh, neutrino oscillation experiments as well. Um, Luke's particular interest is the development of an idea that is called the PRISM concept. 
Um, so if you look at a, a beam of neutrinos, uh, if you're centered directly on the beam, you see one particular kind of shape of energies that are in the neutrino beam. And as you move off axis, um, that shape changes uh, quite a lot. And what Luke really works on is a, a novel, is this novel idea, which we think will give us a lot better ability um, uh, to constrain that those interactions um, that I was talking about. Uh, and, and again, contribute to making these really precise um, measurement. Luke also works a lot on developing models of how neutrinos interact with our, our detectors. Um, and uh, you know, so there's a, there's a lot of work that, that uh, goes on there and is, is very complementary to the things that I do um, in terms of both the current um, TDK experiment and the future Dune experiment. So that's the um, um, particle astrophysics group at Royal Holloway. We'll have a breakout room um, when we get to that point and you can come ask us any questions about any of these experiments. Um, and find out more about what we do. Great, thank you very much. And now I will pass to another of my colleagues to tell you a bit more about the theory activities in the center. Hi, um, I'm Stephen West and I'm a particle theorist. Um, so if we can go to the first slide, there's two uh, members of the particle theory group. They are uh, myself and Dr. Nicholas Cower. So we cover quite a broad range of topics um, from LHC physics to astroparticle physics. So in particular, Dr. Cower is a particle theorist who focuses on LHC phenomenology, and in particular, looking at precision calculations such that we can make very precise measurements and infer <clears throat> perhaps where there are, there are uh, mismatches in what's being measured and our precision understanding of, of what's happening from a theoretical point of view in order to imply, well, actually, there's probably something beyond our understanding that's happening. Um, so uh, Dr. Cower looks at um, aspects of Higgs physics to try and figure out whether there's something much more complicated going on in the Higgs sector by looking at certain processes, measuring those processes very precisely, being able to calculate what we should expect, um, and then figuring out whether there is something um, something happening. So in particular, there is a focus on um, interference effects, where you have multiple um, interactions at play that give you um, some, some noticeable behavior that you can then try and interpret in terms of models beyond the standard, uh, the standard model. Um, so in particular, there's a, a recent focus on looking at particular models of extended Higgs sectors, making predictions for what should be seen at the LHC and then looking at what the data is actually telling you. So that's uh, Dr. Cow and the LHC Pheno that's being done. My focus is more towards astroparticle theory. So we've heard quite a bit of, um, of, of astroparticle already and my overlap is, is, is quite large with the particle astrophysics group. So in particular, I also work on the Quest DMC um, project where we're trying to figure out whether we can detect very, very light dark matter um, in, um, in, in, in the helium three. And in particular, my part of this is then the interpretation of what, what model of dark matter we're talking about um, and what we can say about that aspect and um, uh, in terms of model building and, and, and what that then has an implication for um, for, um, for the origins of the universe, essentially. More generally, I'm, I'm very interested in uh, anything beyond the standard model, um, especially dark matter physics. Uh, I am interested in non-standard non Higgs physics, although I haven't sort of looked at that for a long while. Um, neutrino physics is uh, also a strong interest and I've been working in neutrino physics since I started my, my oh, I started my PhD many, many years ago. Um, I've also dabbled a little bit in, in black hole physics um, and the fascinating things that you can learn in particular um, through measurements that come from LIGO, which you'll hear a bit more about um, in a second. So that's um, the sort of topics that, that we look at in, in particle theory, um, but the, the, the virtue of being a theorist is you get to choose what is interesting to you at that moment, um, or what anomalies are appearing in experimental results and try and figure out what on earth is going on. So that's the particle theory, thanks. Great, thank you very much. Um, next, we will hear about the extra science that we do 
in our group. And I think I have uh, my colleague that will uh, take you through that. Thanks, Veronique. So hi, I'm Stephen Gibson. So I lead the Accelerator Group here at Royal Holloway. Uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to uh, the John Adams Institute for Accelerator Science, which is a centre of excellence in the UK uh, for basically developing new accelerator technology. So we've heard a lot about, you know, searches for beyond the standard model physics, um, but the machines that drive these uh, potential discoveries um, are, are typically um, accelerators and also other uh, fantastic ideas. Uh, but we really work uh, within this research group on developing uh, that technology, simulating the way particles uh, travel around uh, the accelerators and interact with the lattice of magnets and accelerating components. Uh, and so it's a very, it's both a practical and also, you know, quite intellectually stimulating uh, exercise to, to be able to attain the extremely high energies and luminosity that's required to probe uh, the, the future of the field. So um, we collaborate across uh, Royal Holloway, Oxford and Imperial College that forms the Institute. So it's actually a wider body of people, around 80 people in the Institute. And there are opportunities to work uh, not only at uh, those places, but also uh, over at the leading uh, labs around the world. In particular, we have strong links with CERN, you know, Japan, Germany, all the places listed there. Um, Within Royal Holloway, we have three academics. So on the next slide, uh, please, Veronique, uh, we have uh, Professor Stuart Bugert, who has worked on a number of different areas, I would say predominantly now on simulations of uh, particle uh, accelerators, and in particular, the development of a, a custom code called beam delivery simulation, uh, which exactly does what I just mentioned, tracking particles and also their secondary interactions uh, with matter uh, based on JM4. But he's also developed over his um, uh, experience uh, lots of diagnostics. So there's a laser wire diagnostic, which I mentioned on the tour in a little bit. Um, and increasingly, we're moving also into applications of accelerators beyond uh, high energy physics. So in particular, medical accelerators uh, for proton beam therapy, understanding medical gantries and, and flash therapy. Uh, our second academic is Dr. Pavel Karataev, uh, who's also very active on the development of diagnostics. So he's an expert in optical systems and in particular, uh, the interaction of the electromagnetic field from a bunch with uh, dielectric materials and the production of, for example, Cherenkov radiation and using that uh, method to detect and understand uh, what, what, what the beam itself looks like and the, and the part of the beam properties. So it's developing advanced uh, diagnostic. He collab collaborates closely with a number of different uh, research groups. Uh, and we have close connections with Diamond, uh, in particular, actually Dr. Lorraine Bob was, was a JAI student and formerly at, uh, at Royal Holloway here and, and is now head of diagnostics at Diamond. So we have very good strong links with the Diamond light source in Oxfordshire. And then on the next slide, um, my, I'm, uh, yeah, Stephen Gibson. So I'm working mainly on the high luminosity upgrade of the LHC. So that's coming in just a few years time after the next exciting run that's happening uh, beginning this year. Um, there will then be one more long shutdown at which point we'll upgrade a lot of, lot of the accelerator with the aim of increasing the number of collisions per second occurring at uh, collision points. Um, and there's a number of ways in which we can help to do that. Uh, one, one of the ways in which the collisions uh, is increased is to do what we call crab for bunch rotation, so where the particles come in, if we can rotate those bunches and make them collide head on, we increase the luminosity a lot. Uh, so on the next slide, uh, we in particular this year have a project working on the development of a, a very fancy diagnostic called an electro-optic uh, beam position monitor, which is able to detect uh, this crabbing of the LHC bunches. So it's a bit like trying to take a picture of a bunch of particles traveling at the speed of light uh, so you need extremely fast response uh, that, a technique that we use electro-optic uh, lithium niobate crystals for. And so the PhD project would be to uh, develop this technology, install it in an accelerator at CERN and test it and, uh, and, and prove that it works to be installed for the Heinemann LHC. Uh, we also work on the next slide, please, on, um, on collimation systems for the LHC. 
Uh, I think that that's not on that slide anymore. So um, I, th I think the, the other experiment that we work on, uh, which isn't directly accelerator related, this is actually a, a more of a particle physics experiment, um, but we've applied our accelerator model uh, between Atlas and this new experiment, which just been installed actually in the last year uh, at the, in a side service tunnel, uh, that's, in, that's a disused tunnel. So the experiment's called Phaser. It's quite exciting because it basically, the general purpose detectors are great. They look at very high mass uh, decay products uh, that have high PT, but in the forward direction, you might be missing uh, low PT uh, inelastic collisions that are very well collimated. In particular, um, light and weakly interacting particles, perhaps uh, you know, if the LHC is a dark photon factory, uh, we might be missing at the moment those uh, photons in the far forward direction. So by placing a detector 500 meters downstream, we have the opportunity to catch uh, such uh, exciting events and also to study uh, neutrino forward production rates and probe unexplored regions of the uh, current models. So uh, there'll be a project uh, available to work on the you know, operation and analysis of uh, laser data. Okay, so I think Oh, yes. Oh, there's the slide on uh, being background. So, yes, in addition, uh, yeah, we also work on the collimation system of the LHC and how we can clean uh, the particle beams. Uh, so there's generally lots more to tell you about accelerator physics. I don't have time, of course, this probably is uh, urging me on. Uh, but do join me in the breakout rooms and I'd be happy to tell you more. So I'll hand over now to Greg and our dash room from CERN to the tour lab as well. So I'll see you shortly. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much. Yes. So uh, about to uh, dash to, to the lab. There you go. Uh, and so our uh, next presentation will be by uh, Greg talking about a uh, gravitational wave. Hi, everyone. So my name is Greg Ashton. Um, so a little bit of background about me. So uh, my research interest is really about um, seeing black holes and neutron stars, which are some of the most compact objects that we know of astrophysically. Um, and we see them through their gravitational waves. So there's a sort of squishing and, and stretching of space time that happens. And as you may have heard, there's this big uh, detector called the LIGO detector. Um, there's a picture down here. Um, and it's about four kilometers long. It's a big laser interferometer and it can capture the, uh, these observations. So um, I joined Royal Holloway in November. So I'm pretty new face um, around the place. Uh, and I, I currently lead the binary merger group in LIGO. So that's the group which are responsible for finding those signals and analyzing them um, and trying to uh, interpret uh, what they mean um, for the astrophysics. Um, and really my research in particular is about data analysis. So it, it extends from what's called Bayesian inference, which is the framework we use to learn about those signals um, to using sort of machine learning um, and new cutting edge approaches. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, um, so a little bit about then this research project. So um, it's titled Gravitational Wave Astronomy. Um, and this is the reason we say this is Gravitational Wave Astronomy is it's really a new way to look out at these um, black holes and neutron stars and learn about them. And firstly, I need to tell you a little bit about how these detectors operate in practice. So there's a big international network of them um, and they all switch on together in what we call observing runs. And if you look at the bottom, you see a little diagram which shows the different observing runs we've had. So the um, 01 observing run there started in 2015. Um, and that may have been when you first heard some news and something about a Nobel Prize came in uh, 2017 when the first detection was made. Um, the first detection was actually made in 2015 in that um, 01 observing run. So you've had three observing runs now and we're at the little red dashed line which means sometime in 2022, the next observing run is gonna start. And that's gonna be called 04. And with each of these runs, the detectors get better. And this makes things more and more exciting. So, so far we've seen about a hundred of these events, but in 04 and 05, we're gonna see about 300 um, black hole and about 10 neutron star collisions. And the um, PhD is, is really about building analysis pipelines, which can use models of these uh, signals to probe the limits of Einstein's general relativity and extract the maximum amount of science out of this unique data. So this will be an opportunity to run analysis as part of the LIGO collaboration um, and also develop your own approaches uh, to this kind of data analysis problem. Uh, so that's all from me and uh, look forward to seeing some of you in the breakout rooms. 
Great, thank you very much. So there you go. So hopefully uh, that gave you uh, quite a, a good feel for the all the activities that we uh, do in our center. Um, and so we work on Big Machine. We have lots of international collaboration. Um, on the more practical side, uh, you probably saw from our web pages that the deadline for PhD application is the 31st of January. And then that will be followed uh, shortly after with um, interviews. So these might be in person or these might be um, on Zoom, depending on um, where you are and, and what are the state of, of things at the time. Um, and as we said, academics and uh, PhD students are available for discussion after the live tours in the breakout rooms. So I suggest that uh, we then move to the uh, uh, tours and if you have general question about the PhD um, at Royal Holloway, uh, that will be um, possible to to discuss that after the tours. And if you have specific question about any of the research activities that you've heard, then um, that can be answered in the various uh, breakout room, and you'll be able to go into uh, several of them if you wish. Okay, so I'm going to then stop uh, sharing. And um, I'm going to pass on to, I believe, um, Professor Gibson is, is ready to go. And uh, you should be able to, to see him and see what he's going to show you with um, our labs. So go ahead. Thanks, Ronique. So I hope you can hear me. I, I've dashed um, down to one of our uh, labs. Like I've only really got time to show you just the one, but we'll, we'll quickly rotate around a few uh, more. Uh, and hear from other people. So this is an accelerator-based uh, uh, laser lab where we're developing some of the diagnostics uh, that we typically install in accelerators around the world. Uh, in this lab, we've uh, developed systems, yeah, for the um, for, for the Japanese accelerator, for CERN, for uh, Daisy over in, um, in Hamburg, uh, and in particular, I'm, I'm, we're currently developing uh, a laser-wide diagnostic for. Uh, home accelerator, a new one that's being built at the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory um, over uh, in, in Oxfordshire, so the uh, front end test stand. And essentially what we do is to, we want to measure the property of the part of the beam. So as it's passing along the accelerator, we're interested in both the profile, the number of uh, particles within the beam as a function of transverse position, um, and also the divergence of those particles that together form uh, a beam property that we call the emittance. And the emittance of the accelerator is really important for part of the physics because it comes into uh, the beam size at the collision point. If you can improve uh, the emittance of your accelerator, then uh, you can get many more uh, collisions per second. So measuring this property is uh, really important. And the way we do it is we essentially shine a laser uh, across uh, the part of the beam. And as the particles come in, uh, they'll interact with that laser. So there's a few different processes by which uh, this happens. One is Compton scattering. If you have an electron hitting a, a photon, it can Compton scatter forward and be detected by a downstream detector. Uh, the other is if, for example, the uh, particle beam is made of hydrogen ions, so one proton with two electrons going around it, you can actually get the laser to strip off uh, the outer electron uh, and neutralize the particles, so you're just left with neutral hydrogen, and this then drifts again to a downstream detector. And so what we do is we measure the number of uh, particles that we detect uh, downstream as we scan the laser in steps uh, across the beam. Uh, so what I can perhaps show you a little bit here, I'm on a little trolley, just to give you an idea. Uh, so we're in, a, we're in a laser room with a bit of, bit of uh, lasers and, and optical tables. Um, what's, what's shown here, it's perhaps a little bit hard to see, is a kind of an L-shaped uh, an L-shaped red ball. And the particle beam uh, would actually be traveling along this region. So this whole red board would be mounted in the accelerator vertically. And what we have is in fact two laser wires um, that are coming in orthogonally to measure the two different uh, beam directions. They're mounted on translation stages so that we can move the whole beam uh, the whole laser beam across the particle beam. And what one of our PhD students was doing recently with a postdoc was basically to measure uh, the properties of the laser beam uh, using a, a simple uh, 
CCD camera uh, at the virtual focus of uh, this device. So, so effectively where the beam would end up at the particle beam, we're able to measure it also in a different um, location and calculate uh, a certain property of the particle beam. So uh, that's one system that we're developing. Um, over in the, the corner, perhaps it's hard to see, I'll try and reach across. Uh, it's a bit blurry, I'm sorry. Uh, so, so this is a, an optical stretcher, so you can maybe see some gratings over in the far corner um, that does a, a, a stretching of the um, chirped pulse that's coming out of our laser. Uh, and that's, uh, that's helpful basically for stretching the time of the pulse into uh, what we need at the laser wire system in order to measure uh, the uh, very short uh, temporal profile of the, of the bunches that we're like hoping to measure. Um, and then there's one last thing I'll show you as I know time's limited. Um, so this little square box or cubic box in the corner, uh, it's now back with us, but it was, it was built here. And then we took it out to CERN to test in the, um, in the LINAC-4 accelerator, where we've since installed a, a permanent laser wire system uh, along these lines. So this basically consists of a motorized uh, optical beam expander uh, that's fiber coupled. So we send laser light into the box, uh, it expands the beam and then it fires the laser into uh, the accelerator. And yeah, it was a, a successful prototype and the system that we've now built uh, is installed at the at the Linac for new injector for the LHC, uh, which has just actually started to operate. Uh, well, a couple of years ago it started to be commissioned, and now it's fully connected uh, to the LHC and providing uh, all of the protons that are ever going to be collided in future come through Linac four and are essentially measured by uh, the system. Uh, so this is just a brief example of some of the diagnostics we're developing here. The others. Um, I can tell you more about, uh, but, but they're you know, particularly related to the electro-optic beam position monitoring, Cherenkov diagnostics uh, with Dr. Pavel Karatayev. And we're also looking at like, the way that the particle beams interact with uh, beam gas uh, and produce downstream showers over at uh, CERN. So we typically take uh, you know, a number of students, uh, some of which are based here uh, for the first year, but typically always go to a big lab and test those experiments out. So um, most of our projects will be based uh, out, for example, at CERN or at Diamond or, or other uh, big labs. Okay, so I'll be brief and, and allow us to move over to another, another lab. I think are we going to the, the dark matter? Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. So uh, excellent, thanks for that. And I think next, yes, we're moving to a different part of the building. I think uh, Dr. Alexander Diesting is uh, going to show us a little bit about what is happening in the uh, dark matter uh, and detector uh, development lab. So um, I think yes. his, his feed is about to come in. I can see uh, you. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, you. excellent. We can see you and hear you. Perfect. Yeah, right. as Veronique said, I'm Alexander Deisting, and um, I work in the dark matter and neutrino group, mainly on detector development um, with Asha, for example, which you've seen, seen before. And before I um, show you the detector itself, I guess um, I try to give you a small introduction. This is all a bit shaky now since it is with the webcam. But here um, you can basically see a blown up picture of the detector we go to see. It's a time projection chamber basically a huge uh, gas volume and you have some readout on one side and you have a cathode on the other side and an electric field and then particles which pass from the detector like cosmic radiation or um, from a beam would create these electrons and then they drift and then they're read out at the end. And here at the Holloway, we are researching high pressure time projection chambers, which would be very nice to detect neutrino physics and you, uh, sorry, neutrinos. And we also try to uh, read them out with um, Camera, which is like a new readout, basically, the idea is to attach cameras to detector and then but just recharge signals as it's conventional. So here we are going into the lab now. And you see basically this, this huge thing here over there is the vessel, which you have seen in the cross section, section image. Currently, um, it's all nice and silent because most things are off, and the black squares you see are the cameras. I can maybe walk, walk a bit 
bit around and give you a, a different view. So it's it's a massive uh, massive vessel basically we are working with, and then you're basically um, also testing for other um, collaborators sometimes hardware and also developing developing new new hardware um, here, which we then can put inside and then uh, do some tests. So basically, it just gets never boring. There's always uh, new things um, to try and to research and basically to to improve particle detectors, which you then in the end need to measure all the things to, for example, build theories for and so on and so forth. And when you're here, some more equipment with this all the gas supply. It's um, yeah, it's basically an organized mess as it is in most laboratories. I I would say here you see, for example, some um, some of these rings which we have we have not right now installed inside the detector and. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I can't open it for you right now because uh, there's gas in there and we are, we are working with it. So um, yeah, you just have to basically believe me that there is um, some time projection chamber in there which we are currently testing. I can just show you maybe one more thing because we move to the next people. Um, out of the clean room again. So basically, we have an also. So it's not very impressive right now, but you can see on the DAQ computer where we control the detector and they see this, this bright spot here is when actually some uh, some particle tracks is basically some um, ad hoc event display. So you can see a bit what is going, going on there. And yeah, this would be my introduction. I think there are also some PhD students from our group later in the breakout room. So if you want them, you can discuss with them. Or yeah, I guess also with Usher and make questions to people if you're interested. Great. Thank you so much. So uh, very good. And uh, I like it when you wear the hat and stuff. So the joy of working in a clean room. Excellent. So thanks for this. I think next um, we're getting another view of the uh, lab. And we have a, a PhD student who's uh, available to tell you a few words about um, this other area. And we have um, Oli. Uh, so I think his feed is about to come on. Can you, speak? Can you see me? Uh, yes, we can. Excellent. So go ahead. Um, so, yeah, welcome to um, another part of the Dark Matter Lab. So this little um, section here is related to the experiment Dark Side. So um, as was probably um, discussed earlier in the presentation, it's um, time projection chamber. And um, what we're actually doing um, in this lab at the moment is testing the um, silicon photomultipliers that are going to eventually go into the experiment. So um, what we've got just kind of um, dotted around, we've got a, um, our setup is currently a, um, a test stand that's got liquid nitrogen in it. So we can cool our silicon photomultipliers down. And then um, we have a laser up at the top. So this is our test stand set up so liquid nitrogen is in here and then um this is what we attach our um silicon filter multiplier to and then also we've got a laser that points right down to the base which then reflects off and should interact with the photomultiplier with the idea being that um once it's all plugged in um we get a feed out onto our um, oscilloscope and we should be able to identify um, waveforms that we get directly from the silicon photomultiplier and then um, with a bit of um, analysis tools that are, um, that are continually being developed we then take these waveforms and we can um, get out um, certain photon peaks as it were so we have like a single photon peak two photon peak three photon peak and so on and then we're using this to basically analyze um, how like the effectiveness of these different boards, um, how much they're affected by certain noise categories and things like that. Um, but what's really great about this is that um, I was, I'm a first year and I literally started on this on my first day. So my first day involved being a tour around the lab and then coming straight to the test stand and being like, this is what you're working on this year. This is what you're doing, which is brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. So um, I'm sure that um, Jocelyn will be able to explain a, bit, a little bit more detail about and um, Paolo as well about what's going on. But um, yeah, um, basic essence of it is I'll just do a, I'll quickly show what the silicon photomultiplier actually looks like. So our current one that we've got obviously has to be kept in this little case. So it's 
and when it's at room temperature, we don't get any moisture on it. But this is what we this is what we're currently testing. So you can see on the bottom, you can see our silicon tiles, and then it's read out through the circuit board on the top, and it comes all the way out through our feed, and then data goes through the oscilloscope and then onto a computer, and then that's where we do all our analysis. And that's pretty much it from me. Um, um, we don't have anything actually in the liquid nitrogen at the moment, obviously. So um, our full setup is here. And um, yeah, that's it. Great. Thank you so much. Very uh, interesting. So what did you do with your hands before you touch the thing? That's oh, so I, I, I had to touch some static tape that we've got right. attached to some grounding because yes. the, the material is so sensitive that even just static on my hands, if Obviously, you don't, we don't touch either the circuit board or the silicon tiles, but even when touching anything attached to it, got to make sure anti-static first and then, and, then, and then pick it up. Excellent. Good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Oli. So that was uh, very interesting. So, And I think you're going to be in uh, the breakout room of the uh, current PhD students, possibly. Um, I, might be, I might be for a little bit and then I've got to wash up to do a bit more work. Yes, but a bit, bit more measurements. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> okay, excellent. So thank you so much for that. Um, so uh, this was just a, a, a quick tour of some of our facilities just to give you a bit of a feel and, and see in a bit more close up um, the kind of uh, uh, experiments that we run uh, right here. And as we said a lot, we have also experiments that are running um, outside of uh, the Royal Holloway uh, labs um, in addition. Okay, so this uh, essentially uh, concludes this part of uh, the presentation and the tour. So what we're going to do now is that um, I'm going to stop the recording. Uh,